Hello everyone, welcome to this week's weekly EKG. Thanks for coming back. This week our case is a 40 year old male who collapsed at the gym and bystanders say he possibly had a seizure. When you get there, he's minimally responsive and he's laying on the floor. So just like always, we start with our vital signs. You get a heart rate of 109, which is a little fast. Um, blood pressure 112 over 69, looks good. Oxygen 98, he's breathing on his own at 22 times a minute. Sugar's 117, you always wanna check a sugar in your seizure patients. Uh, that looks like it checks out. And then his temp is 97.4. So at this point, not really sure what's going on with him. Don't have much history. Sometimes seizures can present um, after a cardiac event. So it's smart to go ahead and get a 12 lead. So that's what happened in this case. Good job, Rescue 5. Um, so here's what we see. I'll give you a second to take a look at it and see what you see on your own, and then we'll go through it together. All right, so starting out, same way every time, we start with our rate. Computer tells me the rate is 111. I'm just gonna double check what the computer's telling me. We count down, here's one that matches up with the QRS. We do 300, 150, here's 100. So somewhere between 100 and 150. I would agree with 111. So we're a little bit tachycardic. Next, we move on to our rhythm. We ask two questions here. Is it regular or irregular? And this is where you can do the eyeball test. If there's anything that catches your eye, you can, you can use a piece of paper to see if it marches out. But to me, in general, this one looks um, very rhythmic, very regular. I don't see anything that's catching my eye, so I'll call it regular. Next question is, is there a P wave before every QRS complex? Best place to see that is typically lead two. I see a P wave before this QRS, P wave here and here. Lead two looks really good. I'm just going to check the other leads, see if they march out. I see P waves before every QRS all the way out. I'm going to call this a sinus rhythm. So, so far we have sinus tachycardia. Next thing, we're, as we're moving on through our evaluation of this 12 lead, we're going to determine our axis. If you remember, we look at lead one first and then lead AVF, and this is where we get to use our thumbs. If the majority of the axis is up in lead one, then you have a thumbs up. But in this case, it looks like the majority of this QRS axis is downwards. So we have a thumbs down in lead one. We look at lead AVF, though, every, the majority of the QRS vector is up. So we're down in lead one, we're up in AVF, the thumb that's in the air is my right one. That means I've got right axis deviation here. All right. And then next we look at our intervals. This is where we can rely on our computer to help us out a little bit. Our QRS interval is calculated here for us. If you remember, 120 is uh, what we call wide. This is 84 milliseconds, so we're good to go here. We move on to looking at our Q. QTC, this is the corrected QT for rate. We're at 409, looks perfect. 450 is long, anything greater than 500 is risk for spontaneous arrhythmia. So I'm happy with those numbers there. We'll call those intervals normal. Next, finally, everyone wants to jump to ST segments first, but we save these for last so we don't miss any subtleties. And then as we look through these ST segments, I typically start with 2-3 AVF. These are our inferior leads. And what you're looking for here is to see if the ST segment lines up with the baseline or if there's any inverted T waves or signs of ischemia. And so I'm not seeing any sorts of signs of ischemia in the inferior leads. Next, I move to the high laterals. Um, same thing, this baseline looks pretty consistent throughout. I'm not seeing any inverted T waves. Remember, an inverted T wave in AVL would signal some sort of uh, possible issue in your inferior leads. These look normal. Moving on to the septal leads, same thing. Nice straight baseline there. No ST elevation or depression or T wave inversions that make me concerned. So I'll call these normal ST segments. So putting this holistically, what we have here for this 40 year old male that collapsed at the gym, he has a sinus tachycardia at a rate of 111 with a rightward axis, normal intervals, and normal ST segments without any ischemic changes. So what does that mean? 
I'll be honest, I don't think his right axis deviation necessarily caused his seizure, but it's something to take note of, right? So when we think about right axis deviation, this can be kind of a difficult concept to wrap your head around. And the way I think about it, this is your EKG is just a picture of electrical activity, right? So your, your sinoatrial node is sending a signal through the right atrium to the AV node, which pauses for a second and then sends signals down to the right and left sides of the heart. What your axis is telling you, it's a vector. So where is the majority, it has magnitude and direction, where is the majority of this magnitude and direction of this energy that's coming from this depolarization, where is it generally headed? And in general, on a normal heart, the biggest magnitude and the biggest direction, the sum of all of those vectors, goes a little bit to the left, because that left heart is bigger, it's a bigger muscle, it has more pressure. Um, and so it has, it needs a little bit more of that electrical conduction. So that's normal. And you can see here anywhere from 30 to 90 degrees is the general vector that that, that that energy should be going. Well, in this case, a little bit of our energy is actually directed this way. He's got right axis deviation. And right axis deviation can technically be anywhere from 90 to 180. And what it's telling us is that maybe there's a little bit weaker of a force that's going left, and so more of the magnitude and direction of the vectors is going to the right here. It doesn't mean that there's no energy going to the left, it's just changed and it's not typical. So there's some things that can cause that that we're very familiar with. A lot of times it's chronic lung disease. It can be acute as well. So when we're thinking about pulmonary embolism, you may look for signs of right heart strain, right axis deviation might be one of those things. But if you've also got long, long standing lung disease with increased pressures in the lungs, this muscle is gonna get bigger and require bigger forces to help that contract. And so over time, this muscle might get bigger and even get as big as the left or the pressures do requiring more, more of a vector going that way and it can change the axis. So this is one of the most common things that we see with right axis deviation. Uh, we know that Wolf Parkinson White or other reentrant tachycardias, this is where you have aberrant signals coming um, all over the right atrium potentially that are quickly sending signals down and changing conduction basically. And because it's changing conduction, it can change the vector. So it's not uncommon to see right axis deviation with a reentrant tachycardia. Um, other things could be problems on the left side of the heart. So either a left posterior fascicular block or a lateral myocardial infarction. If you think about it, if there's some disease going to the left side that's maybe not conducting as fast or as strong, then the vectors going to the right are gonna be a little more overpowering and it may change the axis to the right. Not all the time, but it can. And then, very importantly, if you see this in children, it can be normal, especially small children. When we're born, you know, the right and left sides of the heart are pretty much equal because the placenta is doing all the work right after birth and, the, and um, the left heart hasn't had to develop as strongly over time. And so as children age, they become adults, obviously, and their vectors will change towards normal. But it's not abnormal for children to have a right axis deviation until, they're, until their heart matures a little bit. So, and that is it for this week. Thank you for joining me. We we're talking about right axis deviation, and I look forward to seeing you next week.